the ancient Hindus, the Sumerians, uh, that we're trying to study what those people were talking about. Obviously, they were far advanced than we were, and that we've been getting dumber as we go down the line. So that today, uh, it's an extraordinary situation that all over the world, people are totally ignorant, ill-informed, unread, dim-witted, and if you, if you try and present something which is out of the ordinary, you're going to be looked at as, as must be an Al-Qaeda agent or, or an imbecile. <laughs> yeah, it must be something wrong with you. Because, you know, because everybody knows the important things people need to talk about and think about is dancing with the stars and football and all the other <laughs> silly <laughs> games that our masters give the children to play with. But, uh, but if you're serious-minded about where we came from and who created us and where we're going, I think looking at this whole idea of the reptilian past uh, might be a good place to start. I was told about ten different stories and, uh, of, of reptilian people who have had reptilian um, connections, and, and each one of those stories was phenomenal. And, and each one, as I said, was very, very powerful stories but very powerful people. And uh, one of them was a very wealthy um, man in Las Vegas who buys and sells hotels and, and gambling casinos. And um, he told me about his company. Um, they, they, he said once a year uh, he takes all his employees, or like eight guys in the company, and they all belong to the same church. I was doing a radio show in Las Vegas, and he called me after the show and told me of his experience. And he said every year they go on a vacation somewhere. And he said then, uh, this was in 1989 when I got the phone call. And he said last year, which was in 1988, he said last year we went to Colorado. And we were backpacking and, and, and camping in Colorado, eight families. And he said we were out in the middle of nowhere camping. And he says then one morning we got up, we broke camp, and we went up to the top of a ridge to overlook the valley, and down in the valley was, uh, was a cleared off round area where someone had cleared off the trees and everything, it was a round area, and we saw a circle of people standing in the valley, all of them holding hands in a circle, and they were chanting and swaying back and forth and chanting, some kind of a ritual, and there was a priest or someone in the middle. And he said, well, we put peace up over to see them. We were up on the mountain, we were looking down on them, um, all of a sudden, in that circle, appeared another entity. It just popped in, much bigger than the person that was there. And it pointed up at us, and the chanting stopped, all the singing stopped, and everyone looked it up and pointed up at us. And he said, we don't know what to think of this, but happily, we're up here in the mountains, and we're getting out of here quick. And he said, so we turned around to leave, and there was a reptile alien standing behind us. And the one that, was, that came in, it was a reptile alien, it was standing directly behind us. And he said, when we turned around to leave, this thing stood there looking at us. That's how fast it moved. And he said, and the children, everyone was paralyzed. You couldn't move, you couldn't cry, you couldn't move, you couldn't do anything. The, he said, everyone agreed that the most they could do was just draw breath to stay alive. That's all they could do. They could not speak, couldn't do anything. Even the children could do nothing. And he said, we were all paralyzed and looking at this thing. And he said, this reptile alien looked at us, he said, was about seven foot tall, maybe taller, was extremely muscular, had a reptile head, reptilian body, and he said, but uh, it just looked at us, and it said to us telepathically, we understood it correctly, it said, uh, I'm going to let you go, but what I do, you better get out of here, because you've interrupted my, you know, my ritual. And so when he said that, the reptile alien turned, and then he turned back around and looked at him one more time to emphasis, you know, you better leave. And he said, when it turned, it was gone. Instantly, it was just, boom, it was gone. And he said, when it left, the instant it left, the light came back into everybody. The women were screaming, the children were ranting and screaming, and everybody, he's including the men, we were running back to the car, we didn't come out of the big time. And he says, um, uh, today, all the eight guys still work for me. That's something, we're all Christians. We've never, ever seen anything or heard anything like that in our life. But we all saw it. All families, all the children, everyone saw it. So he told me, 
So when you're talking about reptile aliens, I got news for you. Where there's at least one we know of that's in Colorado. <laughs> we were there. We saw it. So I'm saying that that's just one of about ten stories I've heard. Uh, there's another story out there that's on the web you really should listen to. Her name is Nancy. She's a, a sweet lady, a friend of mine named Nancy. Her father, she's probably one of the most interesting uh, people I've, I've run into in my life because I can sit and talk with her for hours. Her name's Nancy. Uh, she's, uh, her father was uh, uh, an official with the Air Force. He worked in what she called Project Retrievables, which was any time uh, UFOs came down anywhere in the world, I didn't know this but until she told me, that any time UFO activity happens anywhere on the Earth, the United States Air Force is in charge. I don't care if it comes down in Russia, they have to call the United States Air Force. They do not send the Russian Air Force, they call the U.S. Air Force. If it comes down in China or Africa, it doesn't matter where it comes down, you call the U.S. Air Force, period. Which tells me that uh, with all this hodgepodge about politics, the U.S. is the boss, period. Bottom line. And you may say what you want to about it, but we have the army, we got the guns, we got the money, and we are the boss, period. We catch you doing something that you, that you weren't told. That's why the UN is in New York, the Empire State. This is the Empire, and we own it. And so, um, so the whole idea is that she said that her father was head of Project Retrievables, and that uh, he would, and there was a situation that no matter where they went in the world, she said, I was never in one place too long. We would travel all over the world wherever my dad was stationed. And she said, um, wherever it is that we, we live, we almost always lived on a base. And she said, and she, she went on telling me about all kinds of reptilian stories that her father told her. And um, <coughs> she said, but when the, we always had two telephones, and one was a red telephone. And when that phone rang, you were never to answer that phone. If the phone rings, it would only ring a couple of times. It was not to be answered. It was a tip-off. When that red phone rings, that means your father has within five minutes to be prepared, dressed, with a briefcase ready to go. Because in five minutes from that telephone ring, the military would pick him up. And she said, I've been there many times when that happened. The military you know, knocked on the door would say nothing. There were no words spoken at all. Everybody knew what they had to do, and, and he would just walk out, open the door, go down to the car, get in the car, and drive off. And when they would drive off, four other military guys would come on the property, even though it's on the base, would come on the property on all four corners of the house and stay there until the father got home. And if it was a week or two weeks or a month, every morning, all night, there would be four guys guarding the house, even on the, on the military property. And she said that one night, uh, she always wanted to be left by herself, and the father would never allow her to be left anywhere by herself. And you'll hear this on, the, on her, uh, on her uh, if you go on the web, um, to audio, to the video, and then put in reptilian aliens, uh, Nancy, I think it is, and listen to her tell the story. But she said one night, she asked her mother, because her mom and dad were going next door to a party, and uh, she asked her mom and dad if she could stay by herself in the house, and her father said no. So she moaned to her mom, and her mother talked the father into letting him her stay. And so he agreed, because the mother uh, wanted it. So he agreed. And so when she said when they left, a little while after they left, she said, I was in my bedroom, combing my hair, looking in the mirror, and she said that my closet door was like a French door opening on the closet. She said, while I was combing my hair, a reptile alien stepped out of the closet, but he had to step down to get out from under the header. And he stood up, almost touching the ceiling, and looked at her. She said, I'm looking in the mirror, looking at this thing, and it's looking at me. And she said, it began to move toward me without walking. It just began to float slowly toward me. And she said, I got the feeling it's like coming up on a fly, you know. So she said, I got up and ran down the hallway and ran into the bathroom, threw the window open, shut the door, and started screaming bloody murder. And she said, everybody in the neighborhood heard. 
and everybody come running to the house. She said, when I opened the window, I heard this thing come down the hall. It was very heavy. You could hear it walking coming down the hall. And it began growling and scratching on the door and growling like an animal and scratching on the door. And she said, and when my dad and all the guys came in, uh, come running up, they were all yelling and coming running up to the house. This thing turned around and ran back into the bedroom. And the father came in with the, with the other people and they got her out and the door, she said, was just clawed. So this thing was, was a material preacher. It wasn't just a vision. And she said that the father told the mother, this is why I never wanted her to be left alone. Because these reptile aliens have told us they're tired of the Air Force coming to put their nose in our business. Every time something happens with us, you guys come out and put your nose in our business. So he said, they told me, the next time you go out to put your nose in our business, we're going to come visit your daughter. So just know that. When you come out and put your nose in our business, we're going to send one to, to put our nose in your business. And he said, they, they could have killed her. They didn't. They didn't, they, they didn't kill her. They wanted to scare the family, let the family know, you know what we could have done. This is a warning. So that was scary, just hearing that story. And I, like I said, I've got about eight or nine more of them. So all these stories seem to, as far as I'm concerned, imply that there is some kind of a reptilian past. That's why I don't have any problem with it. Um, as I said, I've never seen one. <laughs>